the fourth of five foundational ministries of Jesus, and we didn't finish it. But I want to go back and I want to touch base on what we discussed a little bit last week because after I watched the message, there was a couple of things I wanted to touch base on and bring light to. But let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse number 18, if you want to stand with me for the reading. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Father, for the next few moments, I pray that you would have your way and that you would minister to minds and hearts and lives. And people would be touched and transformed by your power and by your grace. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So over the last month, we have looked at the preparation for ministry and miracles. That's kind of been the theme, preparing for ministry and miracles. Matter of fact, we all, most of us, made a prayer request for a miracle we wanted God. I hope you're still praying for your miracle. Been praying over these every day for a month and I'm continuing to do so even though October's over because we're not through with the series. And I'm going to continue to pray over those and we're going to see if God answered and how many He answered and how He's moving in conjunction to the miracle you prayed for. Amen? Amen. Because I believe God still wants to do great things in our midst today. So we started on the ministry of Jesus two weeks ago, and we began to discuss these five foundational ministries. The first one was saving or salvation. Uh, he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ for salvation, for redemption. And then the second one was mending, binding up the brokenhearted. Those whose hearts have been shattered or broken. And all of us have had broken hearts or shattered hearts. But God, God brings mending and healing to the broken hearted. Thanks be to God for that. And thirdly, we talked about freeing. Uh, being setting at liberty those who have been held captive. And then last week we began looking at this fourth foundation. Foundational ministry of healing. We discussed spiritual healing. And we use the story in Mark chapter 8 where Jesus was going across the sea with the disciples and he was telling them to be aware and pay attention to the Pharisees' hypocrisy. He called it the leaven of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. And they thought he was talking about bread, uh, that they didn't bring any bread to eat. They were going to go hungry right after he had just finished feeding 4,000 with seven loaves of bread. Now, I want us to get this picture because, listen, all of us are super giant saints. And we would never question the provision possibility of God crossing a sea after we saw him feeding 4,000 people with seven loaves. Right? Right. right. But here are the disciples who were next to him his entire life, his entire ministry, right. and they had just seen him perform this miracle and they couldn't even see the spiritual insight that Jesus was showing. And I made the statement that we cannot see the spiritual realm with our natural eyes. And we cannot hear the spirit with our natural ears. In other words, we've got to tune out some of those things that are bombarding us all the time. So we can hear and see God in our lives and in our midst. Turn off the TV. Here's the biggest one for me. Put down the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Set it down. And just listen. Spend time with God. I said this a while back. And I'm going to reiterate it here. Because I did it the other day. And it was so powerful again. I like to take the notebook that you guys got me. And bring it in here. And open up to a great page. And say speak God. And just write down what God puts on my heart. The verses he puts on my heart. And sometimes I'll pray, okay, God, what about this? And I'll wait for an answer. If I don't get an answer, I'll say, okay, God, what about this? And I'll just listen in silence and wait for the Spirit to move. I wrote another whole page just this last week, week before that, 
uh, of what I was praying about and some stuff I was praying about. And I thank God for those times. Look, we can all find a war room to get into and open a blank page and say, okay, Lord, speak. That's spiritual healing. Because what happens is when we are going all the time and we're wanting to grow spiritually, we start seeing and hearing with our natural realm and we start reacting in the natural and we miss the supernatural. Right. That's good. And so we need to take that time. It doesn't have to be hours. It doesn't even have to be 30 minutes necessarily. It just means getting alone and turning everything out. Say, okay, God, here I am. I want to see you and I want to hear you what I want. Because listen, let's be honest. God longs to speak with His children. How many here have kids? How many of you like hanging out with your kids? Every one of us. God is not a distant father. He is a close father and a good father and He wants to talk to His children just like we want to talk to ours. And I understand there's a lot of implications there, but the reality is if we will just take the time, whatever time that is, and get everything out of the way and say, okay, God, speak. Speak. And then write down what he speaks. And then we talk about mental healing. And I said last week that this is probably the most overlooked ministry in the body of Christ. So it's gaining a lot of recognition. Now, I understand. Let me lay this parenthetical statement out there. I understand there's a lot of misdiagnosis. And I know there's a lot of over-medication. That's not my debate here today. Okay? My debate is mental illness is a reality in our world. And if we can no longer put our head in the sand and overlook it because people need healing. And they need Jesus. Right. The Gadarene demoniac, we would have probably diagnosed him with schizophrenia. Yep. We talked about that last week. Martha, probably anxiety disorder, trying to be perfect on the outside and everything on the inside was chaos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she couldn't focus and function and she couldn't even do what was the best thing, which was sit at the feet of Jesus and listen because she was so anxious and worried about how clean her house, or how clean her house was for Jesus to show up. Listen, Jesus wants to clean your house. He don't want you to clean it for him. Ooh. Hallelujah. That's good. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Just show up and sit at the feet and let him bring cleaning. Mm -hmm. Then we talked about Elijah, who after uh, three and a half years of drought, sat there with 400 prophets of Baal and taunted them and was making mockery of them. And at the end of the day, at the time of the evening sacrifice, he rebuilt the altar dug a trench around it, poured water on it, and said, Lord, hear your servant. And fire came down and consumed the altar, the sacrifice, and dried up the water. And just a few minutes later, it began a downpour for the first time in three and a half years because he prayed. And then when the Jezebel said, tomorrow by this time you'll be dead, he run off and hid and said, God, take my life. Yep. He was depressed and suicidal. Anybody here ever had a great victory and then a few days later you felt horrible besides me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to be aware of that. And we need to understand sometimes mental health is situational. Mm -hmm. I knew a lady one time. Well, I didn't know her. My pastor knew her. And her husband died in February. And when her husband died, the day they had his funeral, she went into a two-week medical emergency. They had to rush her to the hospital. She stayed in the ICU for two weeks and two weeks later she all of a sudden recovered and went home. The next year, the same day, she got deathly ill. They took her to ICU. She stayed in the hospital two weeks. She got miraculously healed and she went back home. She told her family when her husband died, I'll die within two weeks. That's what she told them. I can't live without him. And for 17 years, this woman spent two weeks in ICU. She wasted a year of her life in ICU thinking she was going to die every year. And there was nothing medically wrong with her. It was all mental. 
You see, it's a reality. Our minds are strong. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. There's life and there's death and there's blessing and there's cursing in the power of the tongue. Now, let me say this when it comes to mental health. I don't have the expertise and neither do most of you. If you know somebody struggling, get them the help they need so that their mind can function properly so they can hear the gospel properly and make a conscious decision to come to Christ. Amen. And then he can bring healing. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not popular in our churches. But you don't have to answer this, but I want you to think about how many here struggle with your mind? How many struggle with depression from time to time? Yeah, and it doesn't matter if it's situational or demonic or chemical. That's right. It's still an issue that needs healing so that people can hear the word and make a conscious decision. And so we don't need to belittle mental illness in the church. But we need to help people get the help they need so they can get healed and clothed and seated and in their right minds. So that they too, like the Gatorade and the Body Act said, wherever you go, that's where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And then this week we're going to talk about physical healing. Now, physical healing is probably one of the most misunderstood uh, doctrines of healing and quote... You know, we got people that are all over the spectrum when it comes to physical healing. You got some that believe that physical healing is not for today. <laughs> you got some over here that says if you don't get physically healed, you don't have any faith. Listen, what does the Bible teach? What does the Bible teach? By His stripes, you were healed. Healing is a part of redemption. It is a part of the atonement. It was paid for by Christ. When he died and rose from the dead. You see, James 5 tells us, if there's any among you sick, let them anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and pray the prayer of faith that they should be made well. Isaiah 53, 5 says, and by his stripes we were healed, or we are healed. And Peter 2, 24 says, his wounds, by his wounds you have been healed. Psalm 103 says, who heals all your diseases. Listen, let me make a very strong parenthetical statement because some of us, have prayed for people to get healed and they didn't get healed and it has affected our faith. Our faith is not in my healing. That's right. It is not in my answer to prayer. That's right. My faith is in the finished work of Jesus regardless of what he does and does not do in my physical body or somebody else's. And so I need to understand that when I... Listen, I got mad at God one time. Can I be just transformed? I got mad at God. Anybody ever get mad at God? Mm -hmm. I was praying for one of our daughters who was sick with a fever and a cough and a cold. And she didn't get healed. And I was mad because she was suffering and I didn't like to see it. And then another time... I was sick and I prayed for healing. And I said, God, why aren't you healing me? And he, God said, I already healed you. You just have a virus and it's got to get out of your body. And I was only sick for a couple of days instead of a week. Why do I say that? Because God still heals. But God doesn't heal every time. It took me a long time to learn that. Jesus did not heal Everybody that he came across. But everybody he prayed for healing was healed. Got healed. That's right. That's, 
That's a strong statement. You said that everybody I pray for should be healed? That's a strong statement. I believe that if the Lord directs you to pray for somebody to be healed, they'll be healed. But if you do it just out of faith and say, God, I pray that they get healed, he may or may not. I'm going to come down this morning. I'm going to get real transparent and real real because this is a, such a topic that we need to address and learn about. Even though healing is part of the redemption, God is not obligated to heal everybody. If He was, everybody would get healed. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. We need to learn that truth because what happens is when we place our faith in the answer, the miracle, the prayer, the healing, and somebody doesn't get healed or somebody doesn't get saved, we get mad at God. Mm -hmm. That's good. And my faith is in what I prayed for rather than the one I prayed to. Mm -hmm. And when I put my faith in the one I prayed to, I trust Him to have the answer that's best for the situation regardless of whether there's healing or not involved. That's good teaching. Yes. It's balanced and it's good and it's biblical. So when you pray for people to be healed, believe God for the miraculous, but leave it up to Him. I remember a long, long time ago hearing a testimony. There was a young girl that got deathly ill, pastor's daughter. And they were in praying. And there was this pastor in with his pastor friend whose daughter was sick. And he began to pray. And the Holy Spirit says, release her. Let her go. And so this pastor went into this pastor whose daughter was laying deathly ill on the hospital bed. And they prayed a prayer and released her. And within an hour, she was gone into heaven. And his church grew from 100 to over 1,000 in six months. And all of it was new converts. You say, well, that's not fair. You're not listening to the heartbeat of God. Because God knows what's fair. I don't. Because over 900 people got saved. Because they released this daughter and let God do what he needed to do in order to touch a neighborhood, to touch a community. Are you willing for God to do anything to win lost souls? You see, God didn't want to heal that little girl. He wanted to use her loss as a trajectory for the kingdom of God. We don't comprehend that because we don't see spiritually. We see naturally. We see a father's daughter. We see a broken hearted father and a broken hearted mother who's crushed. But God sees 900 souls that are today or one day will be singing around the throne of grace because God chose not to heal this little girl. Now, I can't explain all of that. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't begin to understand or comprehend all that. I just know what happened. You see, when we start to pretend we know what God does and why God does, we become very dangerous of putting God in a box, if not becoming God for ourselves, mm -hmm. determining what God can and cannot do and what He should or should not do. You see, this is one of the most controversial subjects in church today. But I believe in the miraculous healing of God. And every time I pray, I pray for divine healing. Mm -hmm. And I expect God to heal every time. But I do not put myself to subjection to His healing every time. Because I don't stand by faith in the healing. I stand by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And what that accomplishes. And I'll leave the other stuff up to God. What a powerful statement. Now, I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying that so that we learn and we grow and we don't get frustrated at God or people. Or we don't say, well, build your faith so you can get healed. Anybody ever heard somebody say that? It makes you cringe. I've heard it more times than I care to tell. There's a good Greek word for that. Blowing. Now it may be because of a lack of faith, but it's not certain that it's because of a lack of faith. 
Because if you read in James, he didn't say that the person getting healed had faith. They said, pray the prayer of faith. The leaders, the elders, pray the prayer of faith. It's not based on the one getting healed faith. It's based on the one praying faith. I remember years ago, pastor who had crippling arthritis, he literally walked like this. And he was young. He was in his 20s, young 30s. And he could not even stand up straight from arthritis. And he prayed for healing. And God says, I've already healed you. And for five years, he thanked God every day for his healing. And five years after he prayed, he stood up and walked to his office one day and didn't even realize he was praying free and standing up straight. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Um, why it took five years? You'll have to ask God when you get to heaven. Mm -hmm. I remember the summer of 1992, like it was yesterday. <laughs> I went home and I was working for a computer for my dad. And we put up a little over 3,000 round bells of hay that summer. And I spent 60 hours a week on a tractor pretty much every week, every day. And my knees swelled up like grapefruits and they would turn white and they felt like somebody was sticking pins in them nonstop. And I heard this pastor share that testimony about his arthritis in a service and I went home to my dorm room and I got on my knees and I said God these are not my knees they're your knees and I didn't come here because I want to be here I come here because you called me here and I cannot focus and I cannot learn the way I need to learn and do what I need to do walking across this campus up and down these mountains here in North Georgia with my knees hurting like this that was 31 years ago <laughs> I have Amen. no grapefruits, I have no needles, and I have no pain, and I've had none for 31 years. Amen. Don't tell me that God doesn't heal. I didn't beg. I just simply said, God, they're yours, and I need them healed to do what you called me to do, to focus, and he healed them. Am I saying that if God calls you to do something, he'll heal you of something to do it? I don't know. He did me. He did me. And then I had a professor whose roommate in college, father, got stomach cancer and they gave him six months to live. And my friend and his, my professor and his roommate prayed and the Lord told this son, my professor's roommate, to go on a 60 day fruit juice fast. Juice fast. And he did. He went on a 60 day fast. And on the 60th day of the fast he went into the hospital room where his dad was laying and prayed. And he became cancer free immediately. He got healed. He got set up in bed. He didn't take another chemo treatment. He did nothing. And he was absolutely healed of cancer that moment my God still heals That's right. Amen. the problem is could be several one of the problems is we wait to believe God <laughs> until we hear the result in other words God, are you going to heal them or not? God, are you going to heal them or not? And then when God doesn't heal them, well, I guess God doesn't heal all. And it dampers our faith. And the reality is, if my faith is based on the result of my prayer, it's in the wrong place. We all probably know somebody that's been healed by God because it's part of our redemption. But why then is there such confusion and misinformation? Because, and I've said this, one, we believe everyone we pray for should be healed, and when they are not, for whatever reason, it causes us to question or doubt. Two, sometimes God 
may not heal because the person has no, no plan of changing. In other words, they want God to heal them because of them, and they keep wanting to keep doing what's keeping them sick. Let me give you a good example. We talked about this is what we're going to talk about when we talk about in Sunday school. We want God to heal our high blood pressure, but we keep picking up the salt shaker right. and eating the bacon and the pork roast. Yeah. That's right. Okay? And, and we think that, well, God will heal me and I can keep doing what I'm doing. No. No. If God heals you, he wants you to learn how to walk away from the bacon, the pork, and the salt shaker. Now, if you want to keep eating the bacon and the salt, that's fine. But live with a high blood pressure or take the medication. Right. And we all know it's a lot easier to take a pill than it is right. to stop eating. Right. <laughs> okay, because I like me some bacon. <laughs> I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm just making practical stuff that we overlook because we think so spiritual that we miss the part that God says, if you keep doing this, these are going to be the results. Can God heal from those things? Absolutely. He can. But if you keep eating that way, it's probably going to come back. Because that's what those foods do. Yeah. They cause inflammation and high blood pressure and clogged arteries and all that stuff and heart issues. And I'm not trying to be negative here. I'm just making state facts that we know. Right. Practical stuff that we overlook because, well, I want God to heal me. Where's that salt shaker? <laughs> Where's that piece of chocolate cake? So I'm going to suggest that God heals in three ways. God heals naturally. Mm -hmm. Our bodies, when we cut ourselves, our body produces platelets that run to the cut to cause it to clog so we don't bleed to death. When we get a virus or an infection, white blood cells by the millions attack that virus to fight it off of our bodies. When we eat certain foods, they reduce cholesterol, they reduce high blood pressure, they reduce uh, all the sugar levels. And when we eat certain foods, it raises blood pressure and it raises sugar levels. Yeah. Natural stuff that we've been given that will help our body heal itself naturally. Our immune system is phenomenal. Some are, some are more weaker than others, but still they are phenomenal. The immune system in fighting off Viruses and infections. Do you know how many viruses and infections and stuff are in the world and germs are out there in the world that never harm us because we have a natural built-in healing mechanism within our body? And the better we take care of it, the better health we have. That's right. And I'm preaching to the choir too, so right. don't think I'm putting me out of the way. I know what I'm talking about here, but I have to do the same work anybody else does to receive the same benefits. But we're healed naturally. Secondly, we're healed medically. And this is one the church doesn't like to talk about that much because we want God to heal us. I won't go to a doctor. Right. And the reality is doctors, many of them, not all of them, are God given to help humanity get well. Now, I know we live in a society that teaches just just cover up their symptoms so they can stay stuck. I understand that. I'm not debating that. But doctors that are real and that are honest will work to get you well and whole. That's their job. That's their calling. Many of them. God gave men the ability, doctors, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, and all forms of medical professionals to help heal humans from ailments of a fallen world and from hurting ourselves or being hurt. If you break your leg, are you going to just stay home and hope it heals? Or are you going to get up and go to the doctor and get a cast put on it?
Luke was a doctor. And as such, in first century, Luke would have provided medical procedures, some of which we still use today. Documented fact that in the first century, doctors performed C-sections. Earlier than the first century, if somebody had a brain injury, they would go in and do brain surgery to help the person get well with their brain injury. Before Jesus was born. Now, today we talk about brain surgeon and it frightens us because we don't want nobody. And they were doing it 2,100 years ago, 2,400 years ago. The word physicians in Genesis 50 verse 2 are called Joseph's servants. But what's really interesting is the same Hebrew word for physicians there is the same word used in Exodus 15, 26, where it says God is our healer. It's the same Hebrew word. Huh. I thought that was pretty interesting. That God told Joseph that his physicians that are his servants were healers just like God was. That's powerful. Proverbs 17.22 says, A merry heart does good like a medicine. Isaiah 38.21, Isaiah prescribed a poultice for Hezekiah's boil. Now God healed him supernaturally, but before God healed him supernaturally, Isaiah prescribed a medical treatment to cure the boil. And yet, so often in the church, just pray till you get healed. Pray till you feel better. Pray till you get over it. And yet all through Scripture we find people going to get medical help. Why am I saying all of this? Because sometimes we do not see divine healing, uh, medical healing, as divine healing. It may not be supernatural healing, but I believe that it is divine healing because God gave man the capacity for medical science to help us be healed when this fallen body begins to break down in whatever capacity. And then we have supernatural healing, which is by far our favorite wouldn't everybody here just love it if God just healed everything all the time and all we had to do was pray and we were healed in perfect health all the time? Woo, that would be great. This whole body wouldn't hurt. I was so stiff last night. It was hard to stand up. This whole body hurt. But listen, that doesn't negate the fact that God doesn't heal supernaturally. Because He does. And something that I learned when I got into ministry 20 years ago, 18 years ago, was the fact that if I prayed for my family before they went to the doctor, I saved them many a doctor visits. Yep. Many of them because God healed them or told us he was going to heal them not to take them. Right. Now, I don't say that to boast. I'm just saying what God told us to do, and that's what we did. If you get sick, pray first. Don't wait till you go to the doctor and ask God to give the doctor wisdom. You pray first, and maybe when you go to the doctor, there's nothing there. Yeah, right. Because God does heal supernaturally still today. We need to believe God for supernatural healing. We also know that God has cured any kind of illness that's out there, both supernaturally and medically. And listen, we all say, and, and I'm going to be very careful here, but we all say that God, when someone passes away, that God healed them ultimately, and He did, because they were born-again believers. 
But I believe in praying for supernatural healing here. Yes. There is a passage. I heard this a few weeks ago and I had to study and think about it. And I love what I heard and I've changed my thinking. There's a passage in the Old Testament that said, God loves the death of his saints, something like that. And, and I thought about that and I said, why would God love the death of his saints when he left us here to be disciple makers? Because when I'm gone, I have no longer influence on the people I have my wor in my world. See, God didn't save me to go to heaven. He saved me to make disciples. The benefit is going to heaven. The benefit is eternal life. The benefit is living with you guys there for eternity. But the calling is to make disciples as long as I'm alive. And so if I pass away, I can no longer make disciples. Now, death is natural because of the fall of humanity. We're all going to die. Hebrews says, we're all going to die and then the judgment. What am I saying? We need to believe God for healing and health and life. What is it that Old Testament passage says? You shall not die but live and declare the glory of God. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to pray over my life. That I'm going to yes. live and not die and declare the glory of God. Jesus. Now, this is challenging stuff. Because we all know people that have been sick. And we all know people that have passed away. The reality is, we have to trust God with the results every single time have to trust God with the results. Does it hurt? Yes. Absolutely. It hurts. Whether someone suffers with cancer or whatever, or someone passes away from whatever reason, it hurts. We're humans. We become heartbroken, and we need mending. That other foundational ministry. Don't isolate if you need Mending, let people help. Wow, I didn't even get the foundational ministry number five. <laughs> Listen, pray for supernatural healing, live for natural healing, and seek medical healing when necessary. That's the way I like to put it. Pray for supernatural healing. Live for natural healing. Eat right. Sleep right. Rest right. Take care of yourself. Uh, preach it to the choir again. <laughs> and if necessary, seek medical attention so that they can do their job in part, their part of healing. The fifth and last foundational ministry is anointing. Is anointing. Jesus says, I have been anointed to preach, to save, to men, to free, and to heal. Jesus could do nothing apart from the anointing. Jesus, when he stepped out of heaven, laid down his glory and his robe, and he depended totally upon the Holy Spirit. And he only, this is what I love, he only did what the Father told him to do. What a word for us today. When we go to minister, make sure we're moved of God. Now, we can go and share the gospel and do all that, but unless the Holy Spirit's involved, unless God's prepared their heart, they're not necessarily going to receive it. As a matter of fact, most of the time they think you're preaching and want you to be quiet. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit hasn't prepared their heart. And here's the key, and I'm going to close with this. Just as Jesus was anointed, every one of us have been anointed. Every one of us have been anointed. The word anointed means to be smeared or rubbed over with oil. The great news is we've all been filled with the Holy Spirit. And many of us have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so we have spiritual, should have spiritual insight to the things going on around us. And know when and how to pray. And remember... 
not everybody has the gift of healing. Now, everybody should lay hands on the sick and believe God for recovery. But there are some that have the gift of healings according to 1 Corinthians 12. I don't have the gift of healing. My gifting is prophetic and word of wisdom and word of knowledge and discerning of spirits. Yours is something different. But every gift is for the edifying and the building up of the body. But understand, do not think you are inferior because you have the same spirit in you that I have in me. You have the same anointing on your life for a different cause than I do for being here. Same anointing, same God. You know, we talk, well, that's such a godly man. So are you, woman, man, boy, girl. If you're sold out to God, you're a godly person. That's right. The same spirit dwells in you that dwells in me. All right, I'm going to go there. So why do some people seem to have more results than I do? I don't know. Could be a lot of factors. Ask God and act accordingly. Ask God and act accordingly. Something you might be holding on to. Something you might be struggling with. Could be a lot of things. Here's what I've come up with. Two ways to walk in the anointing. Nearness, nearness, and authenticity. Be real before God. Don't put on facades and be near to God. You do that, and God will show you areas that need healing. He'll show you areas that need to be strengthened. He'll let your weaknesses become his strength because you're authentic and you know you need help. Anytime we think we don't need help, we're in trouble. Because I'm not all that in a bag of potato chips. <laughs> I'm just a human. Broken and frail. Just like everybody else. Who is in desperate need of loving God. Who heals, restores, mends, and all of those things. And frees and sets us free. Because of Jesus. Father, I thank you for today.